Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of The Sweet House. Today's episode is going to be funny and fabulous because I have with me Brian Berry of Nashville Lifestyles Magazine. He is the publisher, but I would say he is the king of Nashville, might as well be the mayor and maybe even the governor of Tennessee. When are you running for office? <laughs> Never run for office or be on a reality show as we have previously Two discussed. Two things he's not going to do, you heard it right here first, is a run for any public office or be on a reality show <laughs> too many skeletons no i'm kidding no, i'm joking you know I'm joking. it's but you know you get to choose how you want to live your life and you've decided to stay behind the scenes on this and you've literally made nashville lifestyles magazine a phenomenon oh thank like, you wow it's, it's a big deal like we all want to be a part of nashville lifestyles magazine all the restaurants want to be in it all the people want to be in it like you've got Nashville Lifestyles, 25 Most Beautiful People. Yes, that you've Hello. been in. <laughs> 2021, right? Yes, 2021, when I was looking like a whale and pregnant. Oh, but... my God. <laughs> but look, you I'm... were stunning and pregnant. Thank you. It was a good time. That was a great party, too. That was right when um, 1230, Justin Timberlake's new. new restaurant mm -hmm. slash supper club whatever it is. We rooftop. were their first big event there on the rooftop. First one. And I was worried they wouldn't get it finished in time. Yeah. Well, it was awesome. It literally was beautiful. And the look, the view of the ramen right there is like one of the best views ever. It's so, gorgeous. I love it. Except and that party was in September. Yeah. And I had on a red suit and I looked down <laughs> and you could see sweat marks all <laughs> over my red Gucci suit. I was like, oh my God, I've sweat <laughs> through my Gucci. Yeah. And Welcome I did. to Tennessee where we sweat year round yeah. because it might be 80 degrees. <laughs> Even in December, like, oh, yeah. literally, we've had some Christmases that were, like, hot outside. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Look, it, whatever. Always. But it's a Nashville Lifestyles party, and we're going to party no matter <laughs> what the weather is. This is true. We are. <laughs> so, I have to ask you, because I always say that Nashville, the show, put Nashville on the map. Because I grew up in Tennessee, too. I grew up in Jackson, Tennessee. Yeah, the only Jackson. city between here and Memphis. And I'm just like... You know, Nashville growing up was not what it is now. And it also was not that five years ago. Yeah. So I say the show Nashville, like really put it on the map. But you also have had such a big role in putting Nashville on the map with Nashville Lifestyles. I mean, you check into the four seasons, you're going to see a Nashville Lifestyles magazine on the table or even a Hilton or what have you. Like it's part of like your news regimen to be welcomed to the city. <laughs> so what would you say? Do you think Nashville the show or Nashville Lifestyles well, Magazine. I would love to say Nashville Lifestyle Magazine. However, mm -hmm. you know, I agree with you on the show, right? Mm -hmm. The show did a lot of wonderful things for the city. Yeah. It opened viewers to seeing things they didn't expect from Nashville, mm -hmm. drove tourism so much. Yeah. The interesting thing is right about the same time, we have the CVC, right? So a lot of uh, cities have CVBs. Uh, ours is a CVC. It's a corporation. So they were aggressively touring other places to promote Nashville. Yeah. Then you have this television show at the same time and, and some other shows that are happening in Nashville. Yeah. And so people started coming in. And to me, that was really like a trajectory moment for Nashville mm -hmm. because it started changing and getting tourists that we may not have traditionally gotten. Mm -hmm. Now, my role with Nashville Lifestyles, as you said, is publisher. And yeah. our job is to tell people about the city. Yeah. And I feel very fortunate to be able to do that. There are a lot of jobs I would not want to do, like accounting. But, you know. <laughs> Me not, either. No I way. I do well with numbers. <laughs> I do Unless great I'm with numbers, them. but I want to say... <laughs> I can calculate that sales tax real fast. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nine point seven. On the Gucci suit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it makes you want to cry too. But yeah, it's like we get to tell people, you know, what's cool, what mm -hmm. events are going on, yeah. what restaurants are new. Yeah. And the thing that I love most is being able to introduce them to people because there's so many interesting people. And back to the show, the show was great for us because we had several of those uh, same people on our covers. Yeah. We did events with some of those folks. Yeah. It was it was great. Raina James was a dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She was a dream. I'm and the like, house, the Nashville house that's owned by Sylvia Roberts on page that mm -hmm. I think it's for sale for like, I don't know what the number is, 12 or $15 million. How long has it been for sale now? It's been for sale a long time because you got to really want that. That's a yeah. lot of money. You yeah. know what I mean? It's a and lot a of lot money of and very custom. And Super so, unique. Yeah. It's like you, you very specific 
interior yeah. design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when you're spending that kind of money, like I saw Michael Jordan's house is still like listed too. I saw that too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. With the gates to mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm just like, but who would <laughs> want it though? Like you literally have to gut it. Like yeah. they just need to turn it into a museum and call it a night. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, and I think Sylvia's place, I, I don't, I shouldn't say I think, I feel like I'm gossiping. <laughs> you guys don't tell anybody this, but <laughs> her We're place. telling everybody. Everybody's going to know. But they do a lot of events at her place, yeah. right? It's like, a, I don't know if it's technically an event venue because mm -hmm. the city of Belmede. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Sylvia. But it's like, you know, <laughs> you can do things there because have events there and cool parties mm -hmm. there. But yeah, if you want to spend $15 million, although I remember when a million dollars was a lot of house in Nashville. Yeah. Then it became $2 million. Mm -hmm. Now it's like $3 million spec houses everywhere. Yeah, And literally. some fours and fives. And I'm yeah. like... I don't know how people afford to buy because these those kind of jobs are not here. No, they are not here. Yeah, no, ma'am. They're not in Nashville. In which I do feel like this is also a recent topic that I have been wanting to talk about. And so, what's interesting to me is like all these companies want their people back in the office, right? Yes. So the the offices are in New York and L.A. So you can't work remote anymore. So this whole influx of people who came to Nashville specifically during the pandemic. Now it's like, well, you got to go somewhere where you can actually like work at these companies. And unfortunately, those companies don't have offices in Nashville and it's so not fair. So uh -huh. I'm like, you know, that's affecting people's career paths and all kinds of stuff. So I do feel like in a sense, it's not fair, but Nashville is a creator economy yes, and it's yes. an entrepreneur economy. And so a lot of the people who live here are making a way for themselves. And that's the cool part about our community. It's a big old city with a whole lot of small businesses that support each other. Absolutely. So to me i've just been like really honed in on that because i'm passionate about business you know that yeah. and i'm just like whoa this is interesting like what forcing people to kind of go back to new york or forcing them to go to la or chicago it's when happening Nashville, it's happening yeah I'm a like, lot of those folks that moved here are going back mm -hmm. for different reasons and some i know a couple of people that are New Yorkers who are keeping a home here for yeah. tax purposes, yeah. right? Because we don't have a state income tax. Yeah. So then they'll go back to New York and live there for their, what is it, 160 days or whatever to have yeah. 180 here, whatever the numbers work out to be. See, Who's not an accountant, count? not an accountant. <laughs> But yeah, but yeah, so I think it's gonna be interesting that these folks who moved here and, and you know, if you have a family, like what it's a whole thing, because it's a lot of Californians. Yeah. And the other thing that's interesting about that, not that I'm a realtor, but people who moved into Nashville moved way out in the burbs because mm -hmm. like out where College Grove is, where you have these big five million dollar homes in those gated communities. Yep. Thompson Station, that yes, whole area. Yes. Leapers Fork. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember the name of that one, Troubadour, where all the celebrities have homes that I don't mm -hmm. think actually live there, but they like have a place out there. <laughs> but people buy and they drive in an hour and they don't care because in L.A. that was nothing. But in yeah. Nashville, I'm like. An hour. I ain't driving that far. I can't. I never get out of the 440 loop ever, mm -hmm. ever, ever. I was saying, we're literally like in the 440 loop. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't. I look, I almost told where I live. <laughs> <laughs> come over. We'll have tea. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm like, come on over. Meet me at the at the suite, at the real sweet house. <laughs> the sweet house. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, no, no, no. But um, it is interesting to me because it's to me, I hope that the Nashville world or just our little infrastructure, because I it's still little to me, even though it's yeah. a city it still feels very much so small and cozy and homey i hope that we continue to like foster an economic environment where everybody can exist yeah. because it is getting out of control with the with the cost of living to a certain extent i true I, I say it not joking mm -hmm. i don't know how i know what the people who work with me get paid right mm -hmm. and I don't know how a lot of people can afford to live in this town. Young yeah. people, single people. Mm -hmm. But then if you've got a family with 2.5 kids, how do you do it? Um, I don't know because I have one and I'm over here like, I don't know how y'all are affording <laughs> yeah. more to all these kids and dogs. And <laughs> I think a lot of it's generational wealth. It's yeah. where they have a grandparent who passes. Yeah. And then and that then money goes the to life the parents. Insurance and or, yes. Yeah. They sell grandma's house and then that's what's paying for the kid to go to private school. Like, it's, Yeah. But even still, though, like the one that's still one percent like there's still like a whole lot of people who are trying to contend with like how to live here so and there's so many people that live in debt that's what's scary but yeah we've turned into a dave ramsey podcast we have turned into a dave, <laughs> look a dave ramsey podcast where we will not tell you what to do with your money yeah that's the 
truth. Like, I'm like, look, Dave Ramsey might tell you what to do with your money and live out of plastic bags and what have you. But we ain't living out of plastic bags. <laughs> and no. Dave Ramsey would not like my Gucci suit. You know, all. I uh, honestly like he's got some great principles because a lot of us come from homes where that you don't talk about finances in your home. No. So I do think his principles are great. But at the same time, I'm like, yeah, do what? <laughs> yeah, no. You want me to do what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, I'm like, look, we can save a little bit at a time <laughs> and yeah. then we'll go from there. But yeah, <laughs> I just, um, I do think that there's a lot of resources to support small businesses though. And it does, I think living here as a small business owner, I don't feel so isolated because like I told you, I just left this brunch and like, we're all like entrepreneurial women. And yeah. so it was nice to be in a room full of women who get it. It's like, and then a lot of us are moms too. So it was like motherhood and marriage and like, what's this look like? How do you provide for your family? And like, how's business going for you? And what are the tips and the tricks of the trade? So it is nice to be immersed in that group. So I feel like Nashville was a very welcoming city. Mm -hmm. I know people hear that and think that we're just being overly generous about mm -hmm. the reputation in Nashville. But I do think mostly people will help other people. Yeah. Um, and like you said, there's small businesses, there's the entrepreneur center for resources. There's, I mean, I think it's terribly important to have a mentor. So that's one thing that's important, but also like I'm, we're members of Soho house, right? Mm -hmm. I'm on the committee for Soho house. Yep. And that is such a welcoming environment for yeah. people in that world. If you are a creator and mm -hmm. it's just great. It's, yeah. I was just a mentor for them for a class. So it's yeah. like, we have a lot of that in Nashville and you're right. They, you don't have that in other cities. No, you don't. Or it's just so huge that it's hard to like centralize it or focus yes. on it. So like we have the entrepreneurship center and so you can go there or a small business. Every city has a small business association or a small business. I forget what they're, what the exact name of it is, but every city has one because they're government run. But even with that, like I feel like ours, they actually do the marketing to let people know they're here yeah. versus like other cities. So, if you want to move to Nashville, just know that you have the backing and the support of a lot of folks here. So and subscribe to Nashville Lifestyles and we'll tell you all yes. the good restaurants. <laughs> um, so tell me, do you guys have an app yet? So or is I'll it something that's like in the in the long run? Well, I'll tell you what we have. So okay. we have social media, obviously. Mm -hmm. The website, we have a weekly e-newsletter mm -hmm. and we have more than just, the, we have a regular weekly and then other ones that come out based on events and mm -hmm. stuff. We do have an app mm -hmm. um, and what it is, is like, a, it, it contains all that information yeah. like in one place. Okay. And then you can also pay a little bit more to see the digital magazine through that okay. and then through Zinio too. I love that. And so the magazine is owned by Gannett, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So was it always on Baganet or did this, was that something you facilitated no. along the way? So, so I'll start, yeah, I'll give you the quick history yeah. of Nashville Lifestyles. So I was with, in high school, mm -hmm. started working with a magazine called Nashville Life. I was 15. I need to pay car insurance. My parents said, <laughs> you got to get a job. And this is a true Nashville story that speaks to what we're talking about. I went to high school downtown in Hume Fog at that castle building on Broadway. I've it's heard that's an incredible high school. It was so hard because mm -hmm. it was a magnet school mm -hmm. and it really pushed me and taught me, you got to do your homework, which has stuck with me my whole life. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to leave school and go to, there was a food court at a mall. Now we have fifth and Broadway back mm -hmm. then where the library is now was in the nineties was a mall called church street center. I was trying to think of it. church street center. Mm -hmm. And it had shopping and restaurants and all this stuff. Very similar. So I would walk over there every day to get lunch. And I would pass this guy getting in and out of, he had a really great BMW that I loved. And he always had a German shepherd with him. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> and so I stopped in it. My little 15 year old self has no problem saying, Hey, what's your story? What do you do? Mm -hmm. And he told me, you know, he owned this building and all this stuff. And he told me his name and I went back home and found out who he was and long story short, I'll just paraphrase. I hit him up for a job. Mm -hmm. I went to meet with him. This guy's probably 60 years old and I'm 15. He's like, so what do you want a job for? And I said, well, I got to pay for car insurance. Yeah. And he was like, okay, how much do you want to make? I said, $50,000 a year. And he said, well, my God, what kind of car are you trying to insure? I said, one like yours. <laughs> and so he said, if you know how much uh, $50,000 is a year per hour, I'll agree to that. I said, it's $24 an hour. And he gave me the job and I walked out of there thinking I was so rich. Whoa. And I got to go to school or cut an hour out of school to go early to work with him because we had study hall. Mm -hmm. So I would work from like three to six 
And then he uh, promoted me into selling advertising that summer Mm -hmm. for the magazine, for the magazine. Okay. And he had a bunch of businesses. So Mm -hmm. I technically worked for a different publisher, but he was the owner. And so Mm -hmm. he had Nashville life, Mm -hmm. but Nashville life closed because all of our subscribers were because of, there was a department store called Kastner Knot. Mm -hmm. And when Kastner Knot closed, I think it became Hex and now it's Macy's. Right. Mm -hmm. But when it closed, there were no uh, more subscribers because he didn't sell subscriptions. And he was like, you know, I've got all these other businesses. Just keep working for me. Yeah. He had a business magazine. But this lady called me like the minute it closed mm-hmm. from Murfreesboro named Stacy Stanifer. And she said, I want to start Nashville Lifestyles Magazine. Will you do it with us? Mm-hmm. I'm like, heck yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. I was, let's see, that was 99. So I was like 22. Mm-hmm. I think I was a senior in college when this happened, if I remember correctly, at Belmont down the road. Yeah. And, um, I was, there were only two of us, just two. We did everything. And I'll never forget. I was at that point, I was living in my parents' house because I was saving to buy my first place Mm -hmm. and living. Fortunately, they like the house was a great setup. So I had my own space and stuff. But I remember thinking to myself, I'm in my parents' house, picking the most beautiful people Mm -hmm. because she lived in Murphy's world and didn't know anyone in Nashville. Mm -hmm. I used the yellow pages to find people. (laughs) Because we had the internet. People don't even know what the yellow pages is. No. This Gen Z, they, yes. they're like, the what? Well, technically, I should say the white pages. Back then, you could just find these people and be exactly. like, I'm going to call them up at home. Mm-hmm. And so, and their address and everything was right there. Right, scary. <laughs> right there. So, yeah. So, that was how it all began. And we started having, you know, we had a party for Most Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was great. It was hard because mm-hmm. we were a startup. There Mm -hmm. were just a couple of us, like I said, was nowhere near the scale that Nashville Lifestyles is on now. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it all began. How did you get connected with Nashville's most beautiful people as a 22 year old in Nashville? Well, I'll tell you, I'll back up a bit. I'll never forget this story as long as I live. So Stacey was in Murfreesboro and I had to go down there for meetings with her once a week. And I'll never forget. She might kill me for this story, but she'd probably kill me for a lot of other things too. (laughs) So we were in a restaurant called the Bunganut Pig in in Murfreesboro in 99. You could still smoke at the restaurant. So she was smoking and ashing into her uh, salad plate. I'll never forget this as long as I live. (laughs) In her salad. Was she eating the salad? The salad was done, but she was just ashing (laughs) into it. And I was like, oh God. And she was like, what should we do? What should be our big thing? I'm like, how are we going to differentiate ourselves from Nashville Life? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other publications that are in town. And I said, let's do a Most Beautiful People issue. I'm like, it's huge for People magazine. And Mm -hmm. she was like, they'll sue us. And I was like, they'll never know. And here we are. (laughs) 24 years years later later, still doing it yeah Yeah. and it's still like such a huge thing too i mean you guys got to have it at harper's this year and then two of my favorite people jarell my trainer and then also lauren who's on season one of the sweet house they're both in the in this in this um edition i'm so excited to talk about them yes (laughs) so i'm such a lauren mac fan she's just the best there are people you meet who just have this energy. You are one of those people. Oh, thank you. <laughs> True though. Like big life energy. And mm-hmm. like Lauren Mack is so wonderful. She and is. Just like so friendly. And she that is. voice, like she's just, I just love her. Like yeah. so great. And so wonderful to work with on that. And Jarrell's just hot. Like let's just call it what it is. <laughs> His body, adi, adi. I was like, good God. He had on like a, like a turtleneck and made it look hot. I'm, I'm like, surprised y'all didn't have him like stripped down and like just that, that, that would show with six pack and all that. For Don't think magazine. I didn't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but the, look, we have to still cater to the audience. <laughs> I might get canceled for that. But yeah. yeah, you might get canceled. <laughs> no, Jarrell and um, Lauren are both great. They both have huge personalities too. Yes, like, yes. And I need both of them in my life. I'm like, Lauren, I need, she's just like the ultimate friend and cheerleader. And then her story is just just so rich yes. and she's so authentic like she's just like i'm down to share it all like yeah. i'm just like so willing to share and she also coming from la because she lived in la and then yeah. came to nashville and she didn't come with that aura that some of the la folks come with some of them are like oh i came from la yes but she yes. came with like yeah i came from la but i'm going to the goodwill and i'm about to make this tablescape yeah. and y'all are gonna like it and guess oh, yeah. what next thing you know i'm gonna be on good morning america doing doing this she just did it 
she did like last weekend. Yeah. But yeah. that's what I love about her. But it speaks back to like, like I said, the connected creator community that we have here too. So everybody is really supportive. But you do have some of these people that have moved to Tennessee and they all thought we were like living in the backwoods, Tennessee. Oh yeah, and like, didn't have toilets. And, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, no running water or electricity. Right. And they came, they all thought we were like, I don't know, couldn't speak English well. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, look, honey, <laughs> California ain't that far. It's just a plane right away. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah but, now you know yeah we have we're about to have an Hermes store and, yeah you know we have a Ferrari dealership we're doing all right we're yeah good. we're, we're doing good. okay yeah. yeah look you were getting paid in high school yeah. <laughs> I was trying. there was a mall downtown that I had no idea about called the what mall again called Church Street Center yeah and back in the day I mean so this is the funny thing how things come around and go and mm-hmm. Nashville's so rich in history too but mm-hmm. I'm like we had that mall then now we have uh fifth and broadway mm-hmm. right but you know I, i'll just go off on a quick tangent and then i want to circle back it. to most beautiful but there's so much history in nashville that's really really important that i yeah. think we take for granted and oftentimes forget right yeah so when you go way way back um women's suffrage right the yeah. right to vote and the hermitage hotel at the hermitage hotel with mm-hmm. ann dallas dudley and just in like you know think about that and then her family was uh, LNC, the largest tower in Nashville at the time, built mm-hmm. in, I think, 54 or something. That's because Nashville was originally an insurance town before it was country music. Yeah. Then we have country music kind of being the thing, right? Which mm-hmm. is cool. But also during that time, you have um, segregation, right? Yeah. And, and the John city. Lewis. Yes. Yeah. Representative John Lewis, such mm-hmm. a big thing, right? And so the sit-ins that happened at Woolworth, I forget what it's called. It was called the lunch counter or something. I don't know if it was mm-hmm. actually called Woolworth. I think it was still time. called Woolworth then. Was it? Yeah. Because yeah. Woolworth was like a Macy's back in the yes, day. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, you know, all that happened. So rich, rich, rich in history. Mm-hmm. So then you move forward and, you know, some of the bigger things that happened are like HCA coming to town and mm-hmm. bringing health care. Then it becomes a healthcare city, right? Yeah. So to your earlier point, people are thinking we're just music, we're just hillbillies, but like yeah. it's a very sophisticated place. And then yeah. I remember when we got um, the Oilers, which is really the Titans, right? Yeah. I think that was 90, 99, maybe 98. We got um, the Bridgestone, which was built. My grandfather had land there, he had a business downtown, and it was taken from the family but it was because that's where they built the thing yeah downtown used to not be that great like mm-hmm. he had a big warehouse repair building place um but it was called the geck then now it's bridgestone obviously which was is currently i just heard this yesterday the sixth largest entertainment venue in the united states bridgestone is six wow based on volume because mm-hmm. they have something almost every freaking night mm-hmm. then we get the preds right it's like there's so much in nashville that's like really really cool so well and two there's so many stories behind all of those different movements that you just talked about and that's one of the reasons why i wanted to start the sweet house too is to have people on to tell those stories yes Yes, because like there's people and not just people in nashville that people who are moving to nashville like even lauren coming here and being like i found my place like i came from la with my two kids and my husband but i found my place here and like jarell's from florida and like i'm from jackson i'm also from tennessee i grew up right between memphis and nashville so going back and forth yeah like i have so much respect for memphis and then i have so much respect for nashville and i hate when people compare the two cities because i'm like they're two different cities yes two different cities with a lot of rich history yes. and honestly yes. the state of tennessee has carried america as far as i'm concerned and so <laughs> many, like, i tell people that i'm like back off because memphis was sanitation strikes and civil yes. rights museum yes. and the grizzlies and just like all of it like i'm I mean, even the pyramid at one point was yes. like the pivotal place for entertainment. It's like there's the mighty Mississippi River it, is was still it Mud flowing. Island. Is that what's there? Yes, Mud Island. Yeah, Island yeah. Yes. And then you bring it on over here to Jackson. You got Casey Jones Village. It's the only city you're going to drive through when you come to Nashville. Yeah. And then you bring it on to That's Nashville it. and you literally have like John Lewis over here fighting for um, civil rights. And then you have the women's suffrage going on at Hermitage Hotel. There's so much going on in this state 
state. And I'm just like, do y'all not realize that Tennessee is like the Mecca? Yes. <laughs> like we are producing Justin Timberlake, some Reese Witherspoon <laughs> and everybody. Van yeah. Jones is from Tennessee. Like, yes. Oh yeah. yeah he's yeah. from Jackson. Yeah. He went to my high school. No way. But yeah. He no, went no. to JCM in Jackson and then UT Martin. And it's just like, this state is so rich Nashville is the capital. I think it gets a lot of the attention, but there's so much in like all the cities, like yeah. even down to military base in Clarksville. Yeah. Like yeah. everything is like really booming in Tennessee when you think about it. It's I'm proud true. to be from Tennessee. Me too. So. <laughs> Me, oh, I mean, it's my whole job basically to, yeah. to be from Nashville. But yeah, you know, to, to what you're saying, it's like all those people that we select for, mm-hmm. for most beautiful it's because they've got a story to tell. Yeah. And I try very hard to pick people that have different kinds of stories to tell. Mm -hmm. Some of them are people who it might connect back to something in Nashville. Maybe it's someone who moved here. I also have a big belief, um, growing up gay in Nashville that like, Mm -hmm. until you see people who are like you, Mm -hmm. it's just different. You know, you live your life, not seeing someone like you Mm -hmm. maybe on TV or in in a magazine or Mm -hmm. whatever. So that's a responsibility of mine mm-hmm. to showcase diversity. And that yeah. also goes to being like body positive and not putting out these bullshit, like unattainable body goals where people yes. have things airbrushed that look so fake that th- now again, we'll airbrush my pictures, but <laughs> other people's pictures. He looks great <laughs> in, in person on camera. Stop, stop. You just stop it. No, but I mean, I just, it's so important to tell those stories i agree 1000 percent. and it's funny because i called aaron and i was telling her that i was going to have you on and i i'm very picky about each of the 10 people for each episode like i'm like i need people who can speak to a vast majority of people who have a rich story who are comfortable sharing that story because everybody's not comfortable just because somebody has celebrity and fame and money doesn't even mean that they're comfortable sharing the story so it is important for us to see and also hear and talk talk and understand each other like I mean there even when people say there's not a lot of diversity in Nashville I'm like hold on wait a minute back it up yeah Nashville has four HBCUs yes so I'm like you know y'all don't realize it but there's four HBCUs I'm like when you talk about esteemed black people Nashville is the number one producer Meharry's the number one producer of African Americans with PhDs DDS degrees and MD degrees they are the first black HBCU CU Medical College. Yeah. So I'm just like, it's here in Nashville. And Fisk is here. Yeah, Fisk is here. The gymnastics team, like Coach Carver, uh, t- Coach Tarver is like killing it with those girls. Yeah. And I had her on this season too. She's episode, I think, three of this season. And she's she's not from Nashville, but she came here and she planted herself on Fisk campus with those women. And she is literally doing, doing the Lord's work. She's killing it. And it's like being able to share share that story too is really cool too i mean she's like pioneering it for all hbcus but then also coming to nashville and i'm like look i think god is doing something special in this city where he's like literally planting people who are movers and shakers to do what they need to do i agree so i don't know it gets me fired up i know (laughs) so my favorite fisk story because i think that is such a gem that we have here yeah is that um so People think when they hear Music City Mm -hmm. that Music City is about country music, right? They're like, why is it called Music City? Because of Dolly or Garth or Johnny Cash? No. It is because the Fisk Jubilee Singers in the 1800s were touring the world. Mm -hmm. Think about that, right? A time in the 1800s, they were touring the world and the Queen of England said to them after they performed, you are so good, you must be from the city of music. Mm -hmm. And that is how Nashville came to become Music, music city. city yeah had nothing to do with country music had to no. do with fist jubilee but even now when people think that nashville's just country music i'm like you do realize that a lot of people come here to record music and it's everybody. not just country music yeah literally everybody. everybody yeah so i just like want to convey to that it's not just um broadway and country music <laughs> and even the broadway bars i feel like are understanding that and even they're starting to like play everybody's music yeah. it's not just country music so yeah. um and which i think tourism has had a lot to do with that too because you've got people from all over the world coming and we got to cater to everybody's um liking so it and why not showcase all the cool things that are happening here like we've got yeah. like you said bridgestone is doing all kinds of shows like this is music city 
city, but it's music city beyond just country music too. Oh yeah. So I wish that like, I know at one point they were discussing having the Grammys here and I wish that they would bring more awards shows here. I know the Dove Awards are here. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, I think that's really cool. Dove Awards are gospel music awards just for those of you guys who are wondering, but it's just really cool. We have a lot of gospel artists who live here. A yes, lot. Lots of them. My favorite CC Winans. Yeah. CC Winans. Oh my God. That is a voice from heaven. Yes. <laughs> like, and also one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. But that's the cool thing too. Like, Nashville also makes it easy for people to just be like I ran into Jill Scott at Walgreens and I was Stop like Stop it I didn't say anything to her but that's the cool part about living in Nashville it's that excites like, me yeah it, it excited me too I let's like, go yes I it, love was, her music. it was just really cool to just you know be in her presence <laughs> oh. but I was like I'm not gonna bother her because then she's gonna want to move out of Nashville <laughs> I used to see uh, Keith Urban and Nicole Kidman at Whole Foods all the time I saw Nicole Kidman at Blackberry Farms my oh. sister had a show at Blackberry Farms and she took me and my other sister with her it was right before the pandemic I think and then um, I saw her out there and she was just just chilling walking around the property I'm yeah. like that is Nicole Kidman. I saw her with wet hair in Whole Foods <laughs> And she was teeny tiny. And one, actually one day years ago, before I had this job, there mm -hmm. used to be a restaurant on Hillsborough Road called Food and Company, or Bread and Company. Mm -hmm. You walk in and get a sandwich, walk out very casual. Mm -hmm. And I walked in, I'd been at the gym at the Y, walked in, grabbed my sandwich, chicken salad sandwich, turned around and this lady was behind me and I didn't see her, so I bumped into her. Mm -hmm. So I immediately grabbed her because I didn't want her to fall over. And I was like, so sorry. And I look up and she's like, it's okay. And it was her. <laughs> and right behind See, her. I would have peed my pants. <laughs> well, I was like, no way. This is Nicole Kidman in yeah. my arms. And yeah, but that was like. To run into her? Oh my gosh. I would have talked her ear off. Oh, I just ran out of there. It's, again, before I had this job now, I'd be like, hey, I'm a natural lifestyle. Do you want to do a cover? Mm -hmm. But uh, she's, yeah. I don't know her personally, but I hear she's lovely. She's done stuff with us. Keith yeah. Urban's one of the best people you'll ever meet. Yeah, so she nice. seems lovely. She just seems like she's just like, just living her life. Like, even though she has all the celebrity and the fame and the money, it just seems like she's just like living her life. Yeah. So. Um, I do want to talk about your experience at Belmont um, yeah. because college is such a like crazy conversation to have with this new generation because they got tossed up and around with the pandemic. Some of them that were in college decided they weren't going back to school. Some didn't even bother trying to like go to college because they see the student loan crisis and that being <coughs> a major me, conversation. Oh, you're fine. I'm we can grab my water go here. For it. <laughs> Have some water. We were just talking about this water, y'all. Um, so I'm not going to talk. You about should get water. a sponsorship. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we won't talk about the water this episode, but <laughs> it is good water. <laughs> it is good water. <laughs> but a lot of people um, are trying to decide if college is worth it anymore. But oh, do that's you think a hard, you'd hard thing to answer? I know. Do you think you'd be where <coughs> you are if you didn't go to college? Oh no! Because I'll tell you why I think. Uh, uh, boy, this is a hard question. I know because I'm asking the hard questions and the easy. I love it. You're Barbara Walters, <laughs> so you know, I think that it's really hard because a college education has become what a high school education was before, mm -hmm. and a lot of people that I know immediately left college and went right into grad school, and mm -hmm. I thought that was a really disservice to themselves because. You don't often know what you want to be. Yeah. So, and I think I told you this before maybe, but I know I told Belmont this, but I think that life sometimes isn't about finding out what you want to do as much as it's about finding out what you don't want to do anymore. Mm -hmm. So that rich man I worked for when I was 15, I asked him, I was like, how did you figure out? And the magazine was just a side job for him. He owned a bunch of like dozens of buildings and other businesses. I'm sure he's very wealthy now. <laughs> He's since passed, but he was real wealthy then. Yeah. And uh, he said to me, he was like, he went to school uh, for agriculture. He thought he was going to be a farmer because everyone in his family was a farmer. Mm -hmm. And his life changed because he figured I didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's hard. I mean, I think the other thing about college is like the most important thing I think a, per a young person can do or an old person can do mm -hmm. is to experience life outside of what they already know. So I grew up in a very, um, I wouldn't say overprivileged, but a privileged life, right? Mm -hmm. White. Yeah. Um, everybody I knew looked like me, mm -hmm. lived, had a house with a pool like me. Mm -hmm. And my parents worked very hard for us to have those things. Right. But I went to Hume Fogg and I didn't know 
I mean, I, I didn't know black people. Right. I did not know one Indian. I'd never met an Indian person. Mm-hmm. I'd never met an Asian person. It changed my life to be the minority. Mm-hmm. And so until you get to know other people and just that there are things out there in the mm-hmm. world yeah. that it's like, hey, there's a lot of things you can do that you may never have heard of or thought of. And then there's also this stigma with college, right? That like, and it's also unbelievably expensive. That's we've got to like mm-hmm. keep things in mind when yeah. college becomes sixty, seventy thousand dollars a semester. It's ridiculous. It's yeah. like give me a break. But there are a lot of jobs because we as a country look down on certain jobs, trade jobs, and yes, things. yeah. And I'm and I just had a plumber at my house. Let me tell you what pay to check more than what I make a week. I mean, yeah. So, Same. you know what I mean? Yeah. So for a little piece of plastic that got stuck <laughs> in the drain. It was, I think it was like oh, $400. Oh, Literally gosh. rain put a piece of plastic down the drain and sweet it wouldn't drain. Rain. I know, sweet baby rain. But I'm like, girl, you got the plumbers up in here charging me all this money. Aaron's already charging me enough for this podcast. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna have to find me a pole here. <laughs> Bye, Paul. I'm right there with you. I'm like, God, I'm going to do a car wash and a bake sale to pay for some of this stuff. But no, it's it, it's it's interesting. I think it's we probably should look at things differently, and mm-hmm. each person should assess their life and say, "What is it I want to do? Mm-hmm. Am I ready to do that now?" I also know a lot of people that graduated with tons and tons of debt, and I'm like, "Yeah, that's going to keep you from having your life." Not that I'm against college. Mm-hmm. Um, for me personally, Belmont was a good school. It was a blur because I was working full time. Mm-hmm. I had some uh, some um, professors there that I really, really liked. Yeah. And so for me, it was good. I was a commuter student because I lived in town. And I, I didn't. I regret not having that on-campus experience mm-hmm. to like meet more people. But I had a very full, busy life. Was so. Belmont a first choice for you? So my first choice, oddly enough, was Vanderbilt. Okay. And the man that I worked for, his wife was a dean at Vanderbilt. Mm. And she sat me down and she said... What do you want to do? She scared me to death. Colleen Welch was her name. She's the dean of nursing. And she said, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know? Yeah, because you don't know. I'm 17. I don't know. Yeah. And she said, do you want to get a go to MBA? Do you want to go to law school? And I was like, I'll probably get an MBA because I thought that sounded smart. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, then don't go to Vanderbilt because Mm -hmm. they're not going to pick you from undergrad to that. Well, I didn't want to leave the job I had because yeah. remember I had to work to pay for I bought a Mercedes my first car I bought was a Mercedes Ooh. my parents gave me a car I traded it it pissed them off mm. but <laughs> I was like I got some money I'm gonna buy my Mercedes right dumb idea <laughs> someone should have said no but I was going you to live college and, you learn. and that's <laughs> the point right it's like you gotta find out what it is you don't need to do or want to do mm-hmm to figure out what's really right for you. And I think college helps buy that time. It does. Mm -hmm. It helps you to just have these years to just figure it out. Yeah. It's like, and to me, even if you have to take out student loans to just have those years to figure it out, to me, it's worth it. Like Alex and I just paid off our student loans. Good for you. Oh my God. I didn't have any I remember when I did that. I didn't have any from undergrad. I literally had like eight scholarships and I got paid to go to college. Oh, good for you. And then I didn't get loans until I decided to go back and get an MBA. And so, oh, you're totally fine. Someone's trying to call me. Sorry about that. Somebody's called. Let me tell you about these telemarketers that keep on calling me. Like, How many spam calls do you get a day? It's insane. About a hundred, yeah. I had to, and I don't know if anyone else realizes this, but you can actually turn on the settings in your phone to like, um, to not let the calls come through. So yeah, oh, I had no, okay. yeah, it's like settings and then calls. I'll have to show you like, but yes, you can like, they still pop up, but the phone doesn't ring. It sends them straight to voicemail. So I was like, yeah, I know. Cause so I literally was getting like 6 million calls after we paid off these student loans. I was like, that was my last bit of debt. And, <laughs> and then I guess like the credit bureaus released, uh, <laughs> released that we were debt free and that everybody just started, just decided to start calling. And I'm like, will y'all please leave me alone. I am not interested in getting in any more debt. I am oh, done yeah. with debt. So we are free. We are free folks. Listen, that's the best way to be. <laughs> it is. I'm so grateful. It took us a while. We were not doing the Dave Ramsey uh, sandwich back method. <laughs> but 
Yeah, we um, which he and I are gonna do an episode to talk about like how how we, we're college sweethearts. We've been together thirteen years, and he and I have the conversation all the time about whether it was actually worth it, and it's so worth it. Like, I mean, I would have I was in college three years before I met him. He ran track in college, and he got to travel running track, and like just all these experiences that we wouldn't have otherwise had if we didn't go to school. Yeah. And I don't regret getting my MBA. I think it gave me like so much more knowledge that I needed because I went to school for broadcast journalism. Oh, awesome. and yeah, I thought that that I thought I was going to be doing the five o'clock news, and then I was like, I yeah, not for me. <laughs> See, so. I wanted to go to UT. I mean, UT. Where, mm-hmm. where did that come from? UCLA. Yeah. I wanted to move to California. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be an actor. That's mm-hmm. what I was gonna do. Mm-hmm. Then I got this job, and I was like, I'm making too much money to leave. Mm-hmm. Not that it was that much money, but to me, yeah. it was at, the, at time. the time. Yeah. But it's funny how like things change. And-, and you know what? That's a good concept to bring up, too, because it's now I'm at a place in my career where I'm like, um, back then I had felt like I had to choose. Do I move to a small town and make like $20,000 a year starting out as a broadcast mm-hmm. journalist? Because that's the reality of journalism. When you start out, you got to move to a small town. They might be making yeah. a little bit more now, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. Depends on the town. Yeah. But journalism, you know, you're kind of in the business yeah. of journalism. It's not a high paying job. It's not a high paying job. It's a passion project for real, yeah. for real. And when you go to school for this, I don't even think people should have to go to school for it. To me, I'm like, well, I take that back. Maybe there's some aspects that you need to go to school for it. But I do feel like it's one of those things where you either have it or you don't. So yeah. I guess I'm just like, it is it is interesting, though, because now it's like, well, do you go for the high paying job or do you just like try to do some entrepreneurship stuff? Yeah. Like, what do you do? Like, do you go to school to be a doctor and you don't really want to be a doctor? Do you go to school? I mean, at this point, lawyers aren't even making what they used to make. Yeah. And depending on what kind of doctor you are, you also might not be making like a sufficient like income for the debt to income ratio that you're going to accumulate. So there's all these decisions around college that I think we need to have more transparent conversations about yes um and just like be open like I I asked Alex I was like should we share that we paid off our student loans he was like yeah I don't see why not because at first I was like I don't share any of that kind of stuff on my social media but then I felt like well let me just tell people there was probably no better night's sleep than the night after you paid those loans yeah no for sure for sure I remember I remember when I was young, my grandparents were very generous to us. And when mm-hmm. I was young in college, because mm-hmm. my parents, they were not hard on us by any means. I mean, they gave me a car and stuff, but mm-hmm. my parents were like, you're going to have to pay for your college, right? They gave me, they did help some. There was one semester and I was like, I'm not going to be able to make it work. I was mm-hmm. like, I've taken out the loans. Mm-hmm. I was working. I had that stupid Mercedes. <laughs> and my grandparents gave me some money to help. Yeah. And I remember thinking to myself, that very moment was a lesson that I was like, I will never be in debt again mm-hmm. to a point like this. Nothing scares me like that does. Mm-hmm. And I remember sleeping so well after like having everything paid off. I remember paying off my student loans. Yeah. I remember paying off my first house, mm-hmm. like all those things. Mm-hmm. And and it's hard because like it's possible is the thing that I think people need to hear and see yes, yes, that it's possible because you see this astronomical number and you fixate in your mind that you're never going to get it done, and it is possible to get it done. So yes. that's why I was like, I just so need to be to, patient. You need to work hard. Nothing's yeah. free. Yeah. Yeah. And also like we're all humans and we're just trying to figure all this out. And maybe your way of the Monopoly game, you had to pick up a few student loans. Maybe your way of the Monopoly game is you went to become a nail tech and pick up 20K in student loans. Yeah. You know, because trade schools cost money too. Yes. So um, in which I wrote this caption whenever I was telling people about us and I talked about my dad. He was a contractor. He owned a construction company and it it costs to get a contractor's license. Like he didn't have a college degree but he had a contractor's license my mom is college educated but it's like either way it goes there's some investment into your future even if you're a small business owner there is some investment into your business whether that is by a personal loan a small business loan or what have you like you're gonna have to make some sort of like sweat equity or financial equity deposit into what you're doing so that's why I'm like just go to college so you can buy yourself some time to figure out these decisions because either way it goes you're going to be paying dividends one way or another you know my little nephew i have two nephews one is in school 
in college. Mm -hmm. The other one's 15. Mm -hmm. And he's in a school where they have an internship uh, Mm -hmm. requirement. So he's in school three days a week and internship two days a week. Are they in Nashville? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember the name of the school. I know where it is, but anyway, it's a charter school. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think it's really cool because he has to work and get to know different things. Yeah. And I think that's so valuable because I would hate for him to graduate, especially today with all this debt, mm-hmm. and then decide, like, I don't want Like, I have a real good friend, y'all. And he graduated from law school and then mm-hmm. decided he really hated being a lawyer. I have friends like that, too. They went to school for, like, very specific professions and then decided yes. that they didn't want to do it. And yeah. I'm like, that's so hard. But, mm-hmm. you know, and then looping back to magazine real quick to tell you this quick story that I thought of. So mm-hmm. one of the most interesting people I've ever gotten to interview and get to know so we do our women in business feature in august Mm -hmm. and we've done that ever since i've been back and we've always done an event because i think it's cool for if you can read about these people in the magazine Mm -hmm. you know you can then meet them at an event and really that's the thing like the magazine is the product it's the oldest part of the business but we really have a brand it's like martha stewart you know she's not just cookbooks she's everything Mm -hmm. not that i'm martha by any means but (laughs) You're the Martha Stewart of Nashville. Oh, please. I, don't ever let me cook anything for you. It tastes <laughs> me like either. Dark. I'll burn your house down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the no, worst. No, I've gotten better at it. Motherhood and wifeyhood have, have helped me. <laughs> oh, good. I, yeah. Well, I'm neither of those, but terrible cook, too. But so I met this. We have these women. It's usually a dozen women. And mm-hmm. long story short, her, her nickname is the Bun Lady. Mm-hmm. Do you know about the Bun Lady? Mm-mm. Her name is Cordia Harrington. And Cordia manufactures the buns for mcdonald's oh but she was a single mom uh got a divorce i think the husband left her but i shouldn't speculate on that but Mm -hmm. she was a young single mom she went into real estate Mm -hmm. she told me i had her on the podcast too so you can listen to our podcast with her she said she did not have enough money to rent an office she had to rent a chair and rent a desk from somebody Mm. and i mean talk about just scraping it together and bootstrapping Mm -hmm. and then she got an investor who helped her uh, do a mcdonald's franchise Mm -hmm. she had the bus stop route moved this is how determined this woman was at this point she lived in indiana if i recall Mm -hmm. and she had the bus stop moved in front of her mcdonald's so people would come and she would get on the CB radio and tell truck drivers if they would come to her McDonald's because it was one exit off mm-hmm. that she would give them free ice cream. Mm. So then she realizes that the real money is being a supplier to McDonald's. Mm-hmm. So she starts lobbying to let them be her baker and she buys a bakery and now she supplies, I think, um, well, McDonald's. It, she does the muffin mcmuffins mm-hmm. all these things and then there's a breakfast thing that she i can't remember i want to say is it's she like, still here in nashville she's in nashville and she's worth hundreds of millions of dollars well clearly yeah such an interesting story and mm-hmm. she recently sold her company i think the company sold for 400 million mm-hmm. and she owns a big really gorgeous building in green hills like an office space like the woman mm-hmm. is so great and i just talked to her month ago because mm-hmm. she was selling her bentley and you, me and cars i almost bought it i was like <laughs> um so cordia I, and I was like how many buns does that bentley cost but it was really nice rain but has a bentley trike i love a bentley <laughs> i'm getting her started early <laughs> i love a bentley it's got a little b on the wheels for my initials i love it i don't have one but i want one look you can get a trike <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what I should get. <laughs> the trikes are only 400. <laughs> I mean, why not? You got to start somewhere. <laughs> I'm like, look, I was like, I'm putting rain um, in the land of luxury. <laughs> start them off young. Start yeah. them off young. Well, that is just so cool to me that you have gotten to meet people like that and be able to tell their stories. It's so. the best part of my job. I yeah. Mean, Dozens of people because, you know, famous people are great to meet. Mm-hmm. It's exciting. Mm-hmm. But there's so many people that aren't famous that yeah. you get to meet. And I'm like, wow, I really get to, like, learn these cool stories. They're doing phenomenal things. Too. Yes. But I also think that that's the part about Nashville that a lot of people don't see. And so that's why Nashville Lifestyles Magazine has been able to have such oh, a like you. staple in the community because you tell those stories. I'm like, we're able to learn about these people from you. That's, Thank you. That yeah. that's how I I truly believe that is my purpose, right? Yeah. Like that is it. That to me is the most fulfilling thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong. Telling people about the new restaurants is great too because mm-hmm. we got all those and the events and all yeah. those things. But to me, it's like there's so many inspiring people here, mm-hmm. famous, not famous. Yeah. I mean, another one just just because quickly is um, Julie Sadler, whose yeah. family was is Monroe Carroll, the Children's mm-hmm. Hospital, and all the things that that family 
has done. Mm -hmm. But Julie is fascinating. She was my first. So Bobby Bones was the first person I did my podcast with. And I'll Uh forever be indebted to him because he jumped on it and was like, yeah, I'll do it. And I couldn't believe he said yes. Uh But Julie's was the first one we put out because I was obsessing over how to edit Bobby's and all that stuff. But Uh plus Bobby gave me like two and a half hours of his time, which was ridiculous looking back. But, and I was like, how do I get this down to an hour? But Julie's so fascinating because like she basically underwrote the Christmas parade for Nashville Mm -hmm. so that it would happen and did all these just really cool things. And of course her dad is the reason we have children's hospital here. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's just, there's so many interesting people here. Yeah. And the people that you just don't, people think Dolly Parton and like, I don't know, all of the country music artists that have the bars on Broadway. That's what people think when they think of like interesting people in Nashville. And I'm like, you will be pleasantly surprised because I was pleasantly surprised when I moved here and actually got connected in the community. Just some of the incredible people that I've met. Like I met um, a guy who owns the peach truck. Um, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I forget his name. I don't know why I'm blanking. We on did it. a story on them. But, um, yeah. But oh the, shoot. He, he was I'm growing peaches not to in his backyard. Name. Yes. It's yes. like what you grew peaches in your backyard, and now it's this huge business. Like how cool was that? Yeah. So it's just really interesting to see it all come to fruition. I do want to um, track back because you yes. went to Belmont for um, your bachelor's if, in business, pretty much. Yes. But you chose this journalism route in a sense, and so I guess a magazine or it chose. Me, <laughs> yeah, or it chose you. But did you feel like you knew your purpose all those years no, ago? Uh, no way. So, okay, so I'll try and tell this briefly, not to bore people. But I left Nashville Lifestyles. Mm-hmm. Well, I should back up. I went to Belmont because I had this job. Yeah, and I got a, a BBA Business Administration. I'm really good at math in a weird way. Truly, mm-hmm. am like kind of a joke, but truly am. Only because numbers never lie. There's numbers are either right or wrong. There's never any like in between. Yeah, it's yeah. either right or wrong. And I loved creative writing. Mm-hmm. There were certain classes like I am not good at chemistry, any of that stuff. Hated it. And I was like, all right, I'll just get this. I wanted to do something creative. I really, really thought that sitting here today, I would have been writing for a television show or something. Like, that's mm-hmm. what I thought I was going to just knew I was going to do it. Mm-hmm. And or be Barbara Walters. Those were the two things I wanted to be. And so yeah. some ways I'm Barbara Walters, but you are Barbara Walters. <laughs> hardly. But so so basically that's how I got why I got that degree. Mm-hmm. Do I use it? Yeah. And so now in today's world, coming back to the magazine, like I'm overseeing all the business mm-hmm. and, and I have multiple markets now because mm-hmm. I'm over magazines for Gannett. So mm-hmm. I have other markets that report into me. And so I have to maintain the budgets, I have to do the projections and mm-hmm. really watch the circulation revenue and the advertising revenue and hiring and managing people and mm-hmm. all those things. So that really did come in handy. Although to be perfectly honest, it's no disrespect Belmont. I learned it from the job, right? It's right. like, because I was never taught like how to do those things necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, and quite frankly, they changed so much from the yes. time you went to college to now that like you literally. They don't even to teach ju- math the same. No, they don't. I, I know I've heard I'm going to have to get. How are you going to teach math? To I, I ain't going to try. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to try. I'm She's going to get us. her a tutor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get her a tutor because I'm not. No, I, yeah. can, I can help her with everything else. I'm good with every other subject. Math. My math teachers, I will say, failed me. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I've just never been good at math. I'm like, I'm, I'm a good student by nature. I've always been A and B student, but like, yeah, I just have never been good at math. <laughs> it's not my forte. I hate it. I don't know why I took to math, but I did. Yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends on your foundation of math. Like yes. I didn't have good math teachers. So I feel like I had to teach myself. And then like, even when I got my MBA, like I failed my first ever class when I got my MBA and I had an awful teacher. So he was teaching a stats class, awful teacher. We had one test and I failed the one test. Then, so I went to Union University for my MBA. So this was at the Jackson campus. And I don't care if he's watching because he needs to know his 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 strategies have to be better. So then I decided to, the MBA, um, I guess the dean let me retake the class and I took it in Memphis at the Germantown campus with an excellent teacher and I got an A. Now explain that to me. Yeah. So yeah. when after that, and this is another reason why I say college has been official because I'm like these two experiences same stats class but I had a horrible teacher in one 
one and an excellent teacher in another one and I walk out with an A like I think the education like system has to be completely reformed if you don't want to teach you need to get your yes. behind out yes. of the classroom if you don't want to teach this specific subject get it moving like yeah. get it moving like because you're failing people you failed me <laughs> yes yes <laughs> you I know? agree with you I'm like and I'm, I'm a living testimony of it and I just so happen to be somebody who loves to learn and is generally just very smart so that's why I'm like I still graduated high school with a great GPA and went had all these scholarships like the math my math teachers didn't fail me to the extent that I wasn't able to succeed but for a lot of kids it does fail them and then for kids who don't have self-confidence to like believe that they can do more like they get a bad grade and they're just like I'm not good at school no you're good at school you just got a bad teacher yes (laughs) Yeah. The only class, because Hume Fog was hard, it was magnet school, and yeah. I did well. The, and then I got to Belmont, and if I'm perfectly honest, I half-assed it. I'm mm-hmm. not going to lie. And the class that I did so poorly on was religion. Ooh. I'm embarrassed to tell you. I got C's in religion. <laughs> but isn't Belmont, like, isn't that a, that's a Christian school, though, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. And sometimes that can be a bit serious about it it was then let yeah. me tell you it was it yeah. was very serious i don't think it's now i think it's a little different now yeah when i took religions of abraham at university of memphis it was very much so historical context yes. it, wasn't, it wasn't very religious at all actually i was i grew up church of christ and like very devout and i was like wait a minute now what <laughs> <laughs> i was like huh? i'm like calling back home and like ma you said <laughs> like, daddy you said but no and so but again it's like given me worldview that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Yeah. So yeah. It's really all about getting out of our comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Meet, at the end of the day, we're all more alike than we are different. Mm-hmm. But people who are different than other people, it makes people uncomfortable. Yeah. That's why we have wars. That's yeah. why we have racism. Like yeah. all these things because people mm-hmm. are so worried about other people being different than them. But I also appreciate you being willing to have that conversation at the stature that you are, especially in Nashville, because a lot of people don't want to have these conversations. That's like, true. They don't want to talk about it. They want to pretend like it doesn't exist. They're fine with their communities looking exactly the same. They don't want their kids to have, not that they don't want their kids to have friends that don't look like them, but they also aren't trying to like get outside of what it is. And I'm like, Rain literally has friends that look like everybody That's and great. she is in some groups because of our economic status that she is like her school friends and she's like the only little black girl at her school that's not my preference I really do wish that like it was a lot more diverse now Alex and I have talked about it we both went to he did go to some private school growing up in Memphis I always went to public school Same. so we have talked about like what this looks like for us when she does to say, well when she goes to grade school I'm like man I really wish I could find like a more diverse school yeah. in Nashville um, but I don't know that's gonna be a, a feat for us I know in Nashville it it is still clicky in some places Mm -hmm. but then I will tell you there are other places that it's not like Mm -hmm. I loved the well I can say this I don't live there now I I still live in Green Hills Green Hills is a big place no one's (laughs) one's coming to my house you won't know his dress but (laughs) come on over bring food and wine (laughs) chili yeah (laughs) But the neighborhood I lived in in Green Hills before was so great. It was mm-hmm. like a little cul-de-sac and everybody knew everybody. Yeah. It was very diverse. And yeah. in some ways, I'm like, it was just its own little utopia. They're mm-hmm. still out there. You know what yeah. I mean? It's just. There are. They definitely are still yeah. out there. Um, I just want it to continue to. And I do have like friends of, that look like everybody. So we are very grateful for that. I think that's great. Yeah. And I want to raise rain like that. I mean, I grew up in environments like that, like. I, and by the time I got to high school, I went to what they would say is one of the worst high schools in Jackson, <laughs> JCM. And I was completely fine. Again, I think that like teachers make a difference. Parents make a difference in yes. the ecosystem. And teachers yeah. really do. I mean, yeah. I think back to some of the teachers I had that really did like touch and shape me, t- mm-hmm. not touch me in a weird way. That's something more, <laughs> pick a new word. <laughs> teachers who touch me does not, sound right. <laughs> does not sound right at all. <laughs> <laughs> These poor teachers are going to be canceled. But, you know, it's like, <laughs> can't take me anywhere. I'm sorry. But, you know, it's like, it is important, though. Mm-hmm. And, and especially young people, because that's how, that's that's when you learn who you are. Mm-hmm. And, and it goes on to when you're in college. Yeah. But. 
So as far I don't know as, why I picked this topic to talk about, but I doubled down on it. Didn't no, I? I mean, <laughs> we could talk all day. You and I, I know, I for know sure. Right? But um, I want to go back to even the beginning of yeah. Nashville lifestyles because it was just you and another guy when you were in college. But then eventually the business scaled to where it is today. Yeah. How were you able to you left for 10 years yes. or a little over 10 years yeah. and then you came back now you've been at Nashville Lifestyles for 10 years straight. Um, how were you able to scale the business to where it is now? Because how many employees do you have? So I only have 12 in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Um, it's funny because when I left, I think it only got up to four or five Mm -hmm. and then it grew and grew when she sold to Gannett. Yeah. Um, I had gone and done other things and truthfully, the short story is I took those jobs for the money Mm -hmm. and the lesson, and I know it's trite and we, everybody says it Mm -hmm. don't chase the money. Don't. They were not terrible jobs. The first job I hated. Mm -hmm. The second job I loved. And then there were two more after that. I fundraised for a friend who was starting a company and all these things. That Some of those things I really probably shouldn't have been doing because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But Mm -hmm. it was great money. Looking back on it, it got me to where I was. Then I wasn't working. I was determined to take some time off. And two Mm -hmm. weeks into it, she called me. The former publisher, Stacey Stanifer, called and said, hey, I'm leaving uh, do you want to come run it? And mm. I was like, what? Yeah. And I do believe like God picks these plans for us. And yeah. like, I was at a point in my life where I didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I had loved working in the magazine, loved it. it was mm-hmm. fun. And you like a big creative outlet for me. Mm-hmm. And so I came back and the way we grew it to my first meeting with my new boss, cause Stacy left right after I started and her boss was like, Oh, I didn't know mm-hmm. this. First week, the new new boss comes in from corporate, takes me to lunch at Bricktops and looks at me dead in the eye and says, how are you going to turn this around? Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do you mean? (laughs) She said, what's your plan to make this profitable? And I said, what do you mean? I thought it was doing okay because Stacey told me it was all great. Yeah, I'd heard nothing negative until then. And it wasn't doing great financially. Yeah. But we added more publications. Well, hell, when I started back, the magazine was only 10 times a year. They mm-hmm. took off January and they took off July. I, yes, that January face exactly. July. Because they wanted to have a summer break and a winter break. Because if you take off January, you don't have to work at Christmas, right? Because oh, you're putting okay. it together then. Yeah. Nice yeah. work if you can get it. But yeah. the first thing Scrooge McDuck did over here was say, we're going to 12 <laughs> times a year, Scrooge guys. Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> And then we brought back a home magazine that we mm-hmm. had shelved, which is twice a year. We have an at home is the name of it yeah. publication. Um, we brought out a cocktail magazine called Swig that's twice a year. Yeah. Uh, our weddings magazine is twice a year. Yeah. And then we started doing events and we're up to like 30 events a yeah. year. Yeah. And social. I remember thinking if we can just get to 20,000 social followers. Yeah. And now we've got a hundred on each platform. So it's crazy. It is. It's literally like continuing to grow, but you're also, you've set the foundation to where it can grow. It's only up from here with it. I do want to talk about what you said, though, because you said yeah. you, God, like, put you in this place because you were looking to take some time off and you're just like, I don't know what I want to do. So my question is, what do you do when you don't know what to do? And I think you somewhat answered it yeah. when I was reading um, Landon's blog. You say I'm a big believer in be- in being still and the answer will come. Yeah. And is this a moment in your life when you're like, <laughs> I just don't have the answers. I don't know what I want to do. Like somebody help me. I did not know what to do. I didn't have a choice, but to sit still in that one. Uh-huh. I was almost about. So when I left the magazines, I went to work for printing companies uh-huh. who worked with magazine publishers because yeah. I could speak the language. And so the first one was terrible. The second one was great. The third one was terrible. Mm-hmm. I basically went to three during the span of like 11 years, uh-huh. which was not bad to hop that much. And so I didn't know what I was going to do. I literally was like, I'm going to go to Europe. I'm going to do all things I want to do. Yeah. And I was back to this, you know, I'm not going to work for the money. Well, it's easy to say when you have money, right? right? You can't say that all the time, Mm -hmm. but sometimes you got to pay the bills. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not going to do anything I don't want to do for a while. And so this comes up, but I'm a big believer Mm -hmm. in being still, and I'll explain it even when, so I've got all these markets now and two years ago, I didn't have all these markets. Mm -hmm. So now on any given day, I'm dealing with clients in different markets, Mm -hmm. planning events in different markets. I'll have people call me and say, Hey, what are we supposed to accrue for postage and 
all these things that I may just not have the answer to. Right. And sometimes it's not even like, can I just look it up? But sometimes I'm like, I got to figure out how I want to respond to this. Right. Yeah. And so I think sometimes it's okay to say, you need a minute. Mm -hmm. You're going to sleep on it. You'll circle back tomorrow. Yeah. And I think that in your life, it can even be a relationship. It can be if you're in an argument with someone or a disagreement. And and I'm a big believer in this. I don't want to say something that is going to hurt someone else. Right. I don't want to say something I'm going to regret the next day. And that even goes, like I said, to like, I don't want to say, yeah, I'm going to take this job. And then the next day be like, I don't want to do it. Yeah. And, you know, and people ask me to do things all the time that I'm like, I don't know how to tell them no sometimes. Yeah, mm-hmm. I get like, this is an example. I'm so thankful that you asked me to do this. I'm yeah. so thrilled to be here, by the way. Thank you again. Sometimes I've been asked to do things I didn't want to do. And I have to think <laughs> like, how do I say no? And it's yeah. a hard thing to say. Mm-hmm. But I think if I personally can sit with it and it's not like I need days, but like usually right, overnight. A, a moment of stillness. Yeah. It's literally a moment of stillness. And the answer will come to me and I will know how to say it the right way. Cause sometimes I'm like, I know I want to say no, right? but I got to figure out the right way to say it mm-hmm. because you can't say yes to everything all the time. Mm-mm. Well, I appreciate you taking the time because uh, I please. know you're busy and you got a lot of people to see and a lot of places to go. <laughs> so I get it. And I'm grateful. You're in the same world, my friend. You're in the same world. I am. I definitely, and I, and becoming a mom has definitely made me refine that too. Cause I'm like, yeah. I just don't have it to give. Like I have to pick rain up and like be ready to rock and roll oh yeah it's not like i'm gonna pick her up and we're gonna sit on the couch and like "Mm -mm." no she didn't care what you did today no she's like i don't care what you had going on today (laughs) and you know what my hardest days have been like blessed by her smile like my hardest dates like moments when i'm like oh i just don't even feel like like getting up today and then i get her ready for school and then i show everybody her little picture She's I'm so just sweet. Like, she I is. saw her little video when I got here. <laughs> she is her little sweetest. jacket. It was so preppy with a white trim. I, I was just, like, stop it. I know. I can't take it. I'm just like, it's too much. I she I asked her this morning. I was like, well, what do you want to be when you want to grow up? Do you want to be Beyonce? Do you want to be oh, a doctor? Yeah. <laughs> What did she say? I'm dying She's this. like, Mom, I don't know what you're talking about. She's like, <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> but I wanted to have you on the podcast too because I wonder, like, you've you've been at this for so long, and there's just ebbs, and I'm glad you mentioned that you stepped away from it, and it, that there was even a point in your career when you're like, I don't know what I want to do because yeah. it's so common for people. I mean. I've been laid off a couple of times or I've been like doing influencer stuff and being like, wait a minute, what? Or like just, yeah. you know, all there's so many transitions of life and what you went to school for is not always like what it is, what you think it's supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, I thought in which it's so crazy because Alex and I talk about this, too. I listened to Oprah's commencement speech that she did for TSU this year. Yeah. She did not graduate from TSU until years later. She in today's time would have never gotten gotten that job at channel five without a college degree yeah oh yeah no way yeah no way no way so even the trajectories of careers back then look completely different now there are there's red tape around all of it like there's qualifications like alex just told me about a lady that works at his company um she doesn't have a degree and they now put in some stipulation that says that you have to have a degree that work to work at the company so she's about to lose her job that she's had for 20 years because you now have to have a degree. And it's just interesting. Wow. Just, so I want to have these conversations so that people are like, for me, I was like, it doesn't matter if I don't know what I want to do. I'm literally going to make sure that I'm well equipped to do everything that I know that I have the power to do. So when I say I'm going to get my bachelor's degree and I'm going back and getting my MPA yeah. and I'm about to work in every every um, every aspect of my career. Like I've literally done marketing in healthcare, health insurance. I've worked for First Tennessee. I started their social media. I'm like, yeah. I literally have done marketing in all these different facets. So when it comes to me doing influencer marketing, I'm not your traditional influencer either because i also come from like all these different backgrounds and like educational sources and all this stuff yeah. and then i wanted to do the podcast because i'm like i built this platform and then i want to be able to talk about like my career at pits and peaks like episode one of this i was like y'all i got laid off like <laughs> i remember seeing that on social when it happened you yeah. shared it because i was like we gotta talk yeah we gotta talk mm-hmm. i'm like but yeah i mean it's the, it's not the end of the world now no. the first time i got laid off i was like oh 
oh man, this can't be life. Like what's going on? I went to college for this. And like, yeah, now this time I'm like, look, I'm good. Like I am well equipped and I'm very sure of all the things that I've done to be where I am. Yeah. And I know that God puts me in the, in the right rooms with the right people. And I don't even have to be in those rooms because God is still making a way, some shape, form or fashion for me to like create and to be in this world. I have Bishop uh, Joseph Walker on and he talked about us being human beings versus human human doings. And it's oh, like, yeah. we're measuring ourselves based off of everything that we do. And it's like, no, we're still beings. So yeah. I feel more present now than I ever have been. And this has been a wild year. I just got laid off in February. That was like six months ago, but I feel fine. <laughs> but you know, you're probably get to know yourself more, uh -huh. right? Yeah. It's like when you are, and I don't mean you, Jasmine, but like people in general, myself, mm -hmm. we become whatever we're doing mm -hmm. and you can't necessarily see the forest for the trees. And it's mm -mm. like, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. The After I left the magazine, and truth, truth be told, I left the magazine because I was worried it wasn't going to make me enough money, mm -hmm. right? Because we were still a startup. I was young 20s. Yeah. And it was going well, but I was like, I got to make some cash. This company offered me a six figure job. I'm going to take it. Right. Then it didn't work out and mm -hmm. they didn't fire me, but they basically said, you got to close this deal or you got to get out. Mm -hmm. We closed the deal and they gave it to the other sales rep who happened to be sleeping with my boss. But anyway, whatever. Right. And that kind of stuff that you got to encounter when you're working in the corporate is so you might get the six figure check. But guess what? Somebody at the company might be sleeping with your boss or what have you. And it's like something's going to happen. Yes. All the bureaucracy and all of it. Yes. And you're devastated for a minute, but then you get to kind of know what you're made of mm -hmm. and figure out that life will go on. Mm -hmm. And it's terrible when it happens. Mm -hmm. But then you you realize, hey, life is going to go on. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it. I'm going to find the next thing and then the next thing and then the next thing. And what I'm doing today, I might not want to do in 10 mm -hmm. years. Yeah. You know, I've been lucky to come back to this and I truly, truly love it. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. There are parts of it that are hard. Mm -hmm. Right. There are days when I'm like, I'm going to leave. Right. <laughs> <laughs> today Look, was the day. But, right. You know, it's like it, at the end of the day. You get to know yourself better. You also know what you'll put up with, what you're willing to do, mm -hmm. and why you're there. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's important. Now, what I think is interesting about being an influencer, if I may mm -hmm. turn Go and ask it. you yeah. some questions. Yeah, ask me all the questions. Because I often think to myself, I should have been an influencer. Mm -hmm. I had this conversation with Mallory once. And I was like, I should be an influencer. I'm like, I have a brand that's just not me. Yeah. But in some ways, it is me. It's weird. Yeah. But what's what I think is so cool and interesting it, in, I like that it has led you here because you were an influencer when you were doing other things. Yeah. But there's nothing better for a brand than to be your authentic self. And mm -hmm. you are that brand. Yeah. I had a, believe it or not, name drops here, but I had a conversation with Martha Stewart once. Mm -hmm. In a previous job, she was a client. I had a very short interaction with Martha. And mm -hmm. fascinating person. And Martha's offices, you take an elevator. She drove her Suburban into an elevator and the elevator went up to her office oh. and she gets out of the Where escalator. Where is this office at? In Miami? In Manhattan. Oh. In Manhattan. She gets out of her Suburban and walks into the office. And at the time we were printing for her and we were printing catalogs and magazines and uh, things like that. And it was like, if Robin egg blue was the color mm -hmm. on the sweater and mm -hmm. it's the color on the mug, it better be the color in the catalog. And it's the same color in the magazine, all this stuff. And she was sitting there and there was a conversation and some, the question came up and I said to her, I was like, we could do it this way. And I'll never forget my counterparts looking at me like, shut up. You don't talk to Martha. Mm -hmm. And Martha looked at me and she said, let him talk. And I was like, Oh my God. So when it was over, I went up and thanked her. And I mm -hmm. was like, thank you so much. I said, I just appreciate it. And she goes, she leans in and she goes, my name is on everything. I make all the decisions. And mm -hmm. I thought she is the brand, yeah. right? It's like, so when I work for Nashville Lifestyles, it's yeah. still part of a corporation, even though it feels like it is mine most right. days and I act like it's mine. Yeah. But what you're doing yeah. is yours. It's mine. So I applaud you for that. And, but, yeah. and it's like, you can't have it any better in no. my opinion. No, no. And it's a full-time job that people don't get. 
But I also oh, I recognize get they you don't get, get it, it, but I get it. No, I mean my neighbor down the street the other day, she was like, So you're doing what again? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying to explain it to her. I was like, Well, look, first of all, let me just break the stigma that people think that we take pictures for a living. That is not <laughs> that is the furthest from the truth. It's not that's not what it is. It's yeah. a full on like marketing campaign that you're doing on top of somehow meshing like your lifestyle with like business with like how much are you willing to share and so on there's a and lot you of decisions basically never clock out like no that's when it, people have said to me before because they're like oh you go to parties you go to swan ball you do all these things mm -hmm. well yeah sure but i don't clock out like mm -hmm. i'm always who uh, i am yeah but that's also fun that you always get to be who you are too and absolutely and that is what working in corporate has taught me because I'm always who I am, no matter where I am. But I do feel like as a black woman in corporate America, I've had to code switch. I've had to like yeah. navigate these harsh terrains in, in the corporate world. I even told uh, Bishop Walker, I was like, man, I really hit the glass ceiling. Like finally, I did not realize that the glass ceiling even existed for, for women because I was just so over the moon that I was about to be like running somebody's corporate marketing and X, Y, and Z. And I'm not saying that that's not a possibility ability yeah but all of the bureaucracy that you're gonna face along the way even when you do the job that's why i love the example that you gave like you hit the, the benchmarks and they still gave it to somebody else oh, these yeah. are occurrences that can happen and i think the coolest part about me is like whenever i heard called and was like oh we're gonna you know um get rid of your job i'm like okay cool i mean it's not cool because you know for what it's worth yeah we won't go there, but at the same time, I'm like, I'm cool because I've done so much outside of here. I've like maintained a business and a brand outside of here. And that's my advice and to anybody. And you're resilient. Yes. You are resilient. Yes, absolutely. But that is my advice to anybody is like, don't just put your eggs into that one basket. Yeah. Even when you go to college and you're told, go to college, get the good six figure job because the good six figure job can go any day now. Yeah. And it has happened to like multiple ones of my friends like I had Kelly Sutton interview me oh um, yeah where we were interviewing each other during that first episode and it's like Kelly gets it she knows yeah she's <laughs> and, been through it yeah a few times and yeah. like is she <laughs> Kelly literally said at some point in your career it's gonna happen so if it hasn't happened to you yet it's gonna happen it's just part of the business so it is. yeah but I do feel like influencer stuff is interesting because now everyone feels like they can be an influencer. Oh too. yeah. Anyone with an iPhone thinks they are. An influencer. Yeah. Yeah. And so that is a, that's a huge like thing that I think we're all navigating is like to how to differentiate ourselves from just any old body. It's like the new modern day uh, telemarketers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Or it's like selling Mary Kay or Avon. It's like the thing, like all yeah. the moms and everyone wants to do it. And it's just like, yeah. You I make mean, it look too easy, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I guess it looks too easy. And I'm not saying that anybody can't do it, but there's just a lot behind the scenes of it. Yeah. Well, you have to be willing in, in whatever it is you're going to do. If you're mm -hmm. going to be an influencer, if you're going to be an executive, if you're going to be a doctor, mm -hmm. you got to be willing to work really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and as I had said in that Belmont thing you got to do your homework right mm -hmm. like I remember I'm going to name drop two people because I want to tell the story mm -hmm. super brief we had Kristen Chenoweth on our June cover mm -hmm. who's a Broadway star moved to yes. Nashville lucky enough that she agreed to do uh, our cover but also to do a meet and greet event with us mm -hmm. where we interviewed her live and I'm asking her all these questions and all this stuff and when it was over she said to me how did you know all that stuff mm -hmm. and I said I read all four of your books yeah and she said I only have three books. And I was like, no, there was a fourth book that you were in. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, I forgot about that one. Yeah. And she, and then like someone who works with me is like, when did you have time to read them? I'm like, I stayed up all night. I did it. Right. You I'm did like, the behind the, because people see you and they like uh, think that you're just the publisher of Nashville Lifestyles magazine, but you're not going to get on stage with somebody and you don't know oh, something about them. I better know my business. Yeah. You better know your business. It's just, you know. You have to do the work. Yeah. You have to know the history behind it. So when we had Taylor Swift on our cover. Mm -hmm. We did a phone interview with her. Mm -hmm. And this is the last like quick celebrity story I will tell you because I feel like a celebrity whore at this point. But <laughs> we did a phone interview with her and she was about to release 1989. Mm -hmm. And her publicist is a wonderful person, a friend of mine who helped make this possible. We have the phone call with her. And I said to mm -hmm. her, Taylor, 
she was young. I said, what is it like to work this hard? Yeah. I said, you were up with the chickens doing radio interviews and you are touring at night. Yeah. I'm like, how do you do this all? And she said, Brian, if I have to take a phone call or return an email, it's okay on my day off. Mm -hmm. She said, it's okay because I get to do what I want to do. Yeah. So we have to like live that life. And mm -hmm. I remind myself of that. Like I work seven days a week. There's no way mm -hmm. around it. And if an email comes in at 10 o'clock at night, if I'm awake, which yeah. I won't be at 10 o'clock because <laughs> I get up at five. I know. Right. Right. I'm like, I like my sleep, but like I'll return it. Mm -hmm. But that's just it. And like the clock in and clock out thing. A lot mm -hmm. of people look at it and say, I want to be an influencer, mm -hmm. but you might not want to be if you realize how much work it is. Yeah. I mean, literally you might not want to be an influencer if you realize like the depth of what you're going to get yourself into. <laughs> yeah. So period. Cause it's a lot, but it doesn't feel like a lot. I don't want people to also think that it's like, Oh, we hate this. Like whatever. Oh, it no, doesn't no. feel like a lot because if it's so routine it. to me. Yeah. And if you really love yeah. it, I know again, it sounds right. But if you love what you do, it doesn't feel like a job. And I never considered myself an influencer. I feel like the word just came about. And now we all just are just under that umbrella. It's yeah. like we're influencers. I just felt like a content creator or somebody who was just sharing my life. Like now it's like now we're influencers. But I feel like I've always kind of just been somebody who shared these things or just like I was the girl who showed up to high school with high heels on and was like, hey, everybody, like. I brought cupcakes today. <laughs> like I've always been that girl that like, or even in college, I ran for SGA president or I was on Miss University Memphis homecoming court or whatever. I've always been the girl that like was knew everybody and yeah. like genuinely wanted to have connections and relationships with people. God, we are the so, same. Yes. I was student body president, class president. I did all, all of it. Yeah. If it and was honestly, to be done, all I was All that stuff do it. transcends into the rest of your life. It yeah. does. Like what, what you're doing now. Like, I mean, I went to, TSU's homecoming parade and I took rain and like the little dancers and the cheerleaders were coming through. I was like, oh man, I used to be a baton twirler. I was in the Little Miss Humboldt parade <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, just all of it, all that stuff. And it's like all of this stuff my mom put me in it carried me and made me comfortable to walk into rooms and be like, I'm Jasmine sweet, like something you eat. <laughs> and I'm just like fine conveying who I am to people. And it's not like a, I'm Jasmine sweet. It's right, like, right. Hey, like I'm just, I'm just fine coming in here. I want to get to know you. I want to see who you are and you know, just how, how can I help you? Yeah. Like, is it mom advice? Like, what is it? Like, what can, what can I do to help you? Yeah. I so, love that. I want to go right on to your life outside of being a magazine publisher. You're also a matchmaker. <laughs> oh, so boy. A new business venture known as Music City Matchmakers. Yeah. So I have to hear all about that. And I have to hear about your love life if you're willing to share. <laughs> well, it, that's a short story. Currently <laughs> single, no dependents. But oh, my gosh. Yeah. Don't have a love story at the moment. Yeah. But you, you, so matchmaking is something I have done for fun. Mm -hmm. And I have set. Um, I just was literally thinking about this on the way over. I've set seven people up. Mm -hmm. Two of them have gotten married. Mm -hmm. um, only two of them have broken up. Ooh. And so, yeah, and so it's random. It all started with my best girlfriend had been single for a while. And she was like, I'm just hanging out with gay guys and I'm never going to meet a guy. I was like, you're right. <laughs> and so I'm like, you're absolutely right. And she was dating guys, but nobody that was great. Mm -hmm. And I just knew her. Uh -huh. And so I asked a friend and I just started asking people and the guy I set her up with wasn't someone that she traditionally would have gone out with. Uh -huh. He was from Mississippi and had like a Mississippi accent. <laughs> great guy. Very brilliant guy. Uh -huh. um, has a great career. They are now married with two children. They've been married for 10 years. Uh -huh. And, you know, it just takes that. And I think a lot of times in relationships specifically uh -huh. people and i'm i myself i'm guilty of this uh -huh. have an idea of who they need to be with and uh -huh. he needs to be six feet two and he should be a doctor or a lawyer uh -huh. and all these things in my head yeah that really don't matter at yeah. the end of the day you should be with someone who is compassionate mm -hmm. who is kind who is caring who respects you 
And you need to have the same trajectory in life. Like okay. you got to know that you both are ready to be in a relationship. To okay. me, that's the biggest thing. People go into a relationship knowing the other person probably isn't ready mm -hmm. and they think they're going to change them. Yeah. And it ain't going to happen. Mm -mm. I've seen it time and time and time again. I've done it time and yeah. time again. The easiest relationship to have is one that you know will never work out. Absolutely. And so I started doing this and we launched it as a business. It's like a side business. It's like mm -hmm. a fun thing me and someone else mm -hmm. um and we did one social media post he did one tiktok post and we had over a thousand women sign up for more information wow not even 24 hours and i was like take it down take it down <laughs> I'm like, Ooh. and the problem so what i realized in this business is that there were so few men mm -hmm. and an interview. And then I was like, I just don't have time with all the markets in the magazine to do it, but I've kept it because I'm like, I'll take on a couple of clients, mm -hmm. but I can't, I don't want it to turn into a algorithm thing mm -hmm. and all that stuff that you could get with a match.com. Right. Mm -hmm. But I will do events with it. And honestly, I'm going to pair it with national lifestyles because it makes sense that way. Right. And but it's been so fascinating to me. But, you know, it's hard for I will say this and I don't mean to be sexist because I am a guy, mm -hmm. but I think it's hard for women to date in this town specifically. Yeah, because a lot of young people move here. And if you're a guy and you just want a quick day to hook up, whatever, you there's so many it. bachelorettes in town every weekend. They just want to have fun. Yeah. And so it's like you both got to be in the same like mental state mm -hmm. maturity state yeah. emotional state Financial that you want state. that's yeah. true too yeah that you want to have a relationship mm -hmm. because otherwise it's, it's just not going to work this girlfriend of mine who's really great at this stuff mm -hmm. uh she said it's like a taxi cab you got to have the light on mm -hmm. because otherwise you're not ready and they're not ready right yeah. and like you can date and have fun and whatever but until you're like i'm actually serious about being in a relationship so that's what Music City Matchmakers is. I've, I've got a couple of people that I'm helping now mm -hmm. and I'm super selective about it. It doesn't mean I don't want more people Everybody, to join yeah. and it's free. Mm -hmm. It's not something I'm charging for. I mm -hmm. charge if we get into like serious stuff, but mm -hmm. I'm setting them up with like life coaches and counselors. And That's awesome. Yeah, it's yeah. fun. I mean, again, I can't necessary. take on all thousand, but yeah, it's all necessary parts of relationships too. So yeah. I love that you are actually setting them up with the tools they need to succeed for sure. So yeah. Music City Matchmakers, you guys, go check it <laughs> out. I have to ask you what's your favorite event in the city? Oh, okay. So I love Swan Ball, but mm -hmm. my favorite Nashville Lifestyles event mm -hmm. is probably Women in Business. Okay. I find it so inspiring. Mm -hmm. I just, I find it so inspiring. And it's open to the public because like we do an event for uh, most beautiful people, but that's only for the people who are being honored. Mm -hmm. But when we do Women in Business, I'm like... it. If you don't cry during women in business, yeah, I don't know what's wrong with you. Yeah, women in business <laughs> gets me. The stories are great, and I always love going. I'm always inspired. Thank you. The year Mallory and Hunter um, were, yes, yeah, yeah, I love that year. That year was incredible. And then last year, Kirby, one of my yeah, other good friends. yeah, yeah. I mean, every year you're like introducing this whole new class of women who are killing it in Nashville for sure. So thank keep you doing for supporting. That. Of course, I'm always there. I didn't get to come to the one this year. But next year, I am there. I've literally been the past, uh, like, three years. And then this year, I didn't get to come. I can't remember what I had going on. But well, you got a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, a whole lot going on, 24-7. Okay, because winter and holiday activity is, like, right around the corner. What's your favorite to do in Nashville? Oh, so a couple of big things that I love at holiday. Mm -hmm. I love Cheekwood at Christmas. When they yeah. do lights, it's just so pretty. And mm -hmm. they have a reindeer or a yeah. couple of reindeer. Yeah. I just, to me, I think Cheekwood is just such a special place it is it's a family staple it's on my list that's like my sweet family tradition yeah. i grew up my hockett side so my maiden name i grew up going to gaylord opryland every year i for, was my second thing yeah. is ice yes that was so be, good so so they i'm sure you know they do the tree lighting ceremony mm -hmm. and then yeah. ice they really spare no expense to do they this don't. Mm -hmm. and if you have kids I think there's nothing better than to take your kids for them to experience yeah. the entire resort mm -hmm. as Christmas, but then take them to ice and like, 
I remember last year watching kids come down the little ice sled mm -hmm. and I was like, this is just going to be such a memory for them. It you is. Know? And while ice costs, I do want to point out that Gaylord Opryland is free. Yes. Anybody yes. can just walk into the hotel and experience the lights and just like really feel the joy of Christmas. And like, I'm the youngest of five. So my parents literally drove, drove us up here to Nashville and we were in Gaylord Opryland <laughs> yeah. experiencing all the free Christmas lights yeah. and stuff. So, and I'm so grateful to them for it because for the past two years I've been taking rain and I'm just like that is forever like my late dad he died in 2016 and I'm like I'm sorry. man I wish he was still here to see this but I know he's still with us and like feels all of it but it's such a joy. So I had to ask that question of you because I'm like, there's some things in Nashville that will never go anywhere. I mean, I'm like 34 years old and I'm still going to Gaylord Opryland yeah, for Christmas. Same. Me too. Yeah. And it's just like, I, I wish I was 34, but yeah, I'm, I'm still look, going. Rain's literally going to be taking her kids <laughs> yeah. and I'll be there in spirit if I'm not alive. <laughs> I'll be in a wheelchair. Just wave at me. <laughs> Look, that's all right. We're going to make it happen. But OK, so I feel like you've answered most of my questions, <laughs> but I have one last question oh, for it. you. What is the ultimate Nashville lifestyle? Oh, boy, that's a hard question. You know what? I think the ultimate Nashville lifestyle is living well. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is experiencing all the things we have here mm -hmm. and we have live music like nobody else has, right? Yeah. We have this great community like nobody else has. Yeah. And there's not a single restaurant or type of cuisine that we don't have now. Like yeah. we couldn't say that even two or three years ago. Exactly. So, and there's always something to do. Every Friday on Instagram, we put out things to do for the weekend and we have to cut it back. So we only put five things. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, sometimes there could be 20 things that weekend, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's a great place to live. Yeah. I feel like that's a great answer for what's a Nashville lifestyle because oh, thank you. I definitely feel like it, there's so much to offer here and every lifestyle counts here. Yes. And so yes. that's the cool thing too. There's free stuff. There's luxury stuff. If that's what you want, like there's literally a pocket of town for everybody and there's food for everybody. There's festivals for everybody. And I'm just excited for all that's coming to Nashville, our new yeah. stadium and just so all exciting. of it. Yes. So, you guys, make sure you follow Brian Berry of Nashville Lifestyles. He has pioneered this magazine and is continuing to show us the history of Nashville and also giving us the present and the presence of being in Nashville. <laughs> so, I just want to say you have to have, I'm giving you all your flowers today. Thank because, you. So, I'll take them all. You Thank know, you, Jasmine. Yes. Come into the Sweet House. I give everybody their flowers and we're just <laughs> so grateful. I'm grateful to hear from you and just all of your experience. You've been on the ground doing the work, setting the foundation, and I'm thank happy you. to be here to witness it and to be in your presence. So oh, you're thank so you for sweet. coming to the Sweet House. Thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. Yay.